everybody here. Great, welcome. Hello, I'm Alice Hutchinson, the owner of Birds Books, an independent bookstore in Bethel, Connecticut, and I am honored to be the host of Write America. The aim of this series is to help set the country back on a correct, productive course of freedom, justice, equality, and plain human kindness. Write America is a literary series created by author Roger Rosenblatt, featuring award-winning, nationally renowned authors and new and emerging writers in readings and conversations each week about how books and art might bridge the deep divisions in our nation. Write America celebrates the quiet power of art in our lives, the unifying power of the highest uses of language. In novels, stories, essays, and poems, we recognize one another as parts of the human family, one family. Roger Rosenblatt, the creator of Write America, puts it this way, writing makes justice desirable, evil intelligible, grief endurable, and love possible. So with that, I welcome you. And please join us as we wind up our two-year run with episodes through January of 2023 with several of the most beloved and distinguished writers in the country as they read from their works and talk to each other and with you in an effort to bring us together. If you missed our last episode with Alice McDermott and Jill McCorkle, you can go to Birds Books Write America page and link to the episode easily. All of our recordings will reside on our Write America YouTube channel for you to watch at any time. Tonight's episode is also being recorded, so if you missed something, you can go back and rewatch. The link is right on the front page of our website. Tonight, we are hosting readings by and conversation with Francine Prose and Billy Collins. I will return at the end after the readings and discussion to bring your questions and comments to the authors. During the episode, please feel free to make comments or ask questions in the chat. We do ask that you remain muted, however. Our first speaker is Francine Prose. Francine Prose is the author of 21 works of fiction, including highly acclaimed Mr. Monkey, the New York Times bestseller Lovers at Chameleon Club, Paris 1932, The Changed Man, which won the Dayton Literary Peace Prize, and Blue Angel, which was the finalist for the National Book Award. Her works of nonfiction include the highly praised Anne Frank, the book The Life, the Afterlife, and the New York Times bestseller Reading Like, Write, Reading like a Writer, which, was, which has become a classic. The recipient of numerous grants and honors, including a Guggenheim and a Fulbright, a director's fellow at the Center for Scholars and Writers at the New York Public Library, prose is a former president of Penn America Center and a member of the American Academy of Arts and Letters and the American Academy of Arts and Sciences. Her latest book, Cleopatra, Her History, Her Myth, was released in November. She is a distinguished writer in residence at, Bard, at, Bard's, at Bard College. Excuse me. Please welcome to the screen. Francine Prose. Thank you, Alice. I hope you can all hear me. Is this I'm okay? Oh, so I'm I'm going to read um I'm going to read from a work in progress, which is probably a terrible idea, but I thought I would just in case I'm not nervous enough ever I thought I would do that. Anyway, as I as I told Roger Rosenblatt, uh, he makes a very brief cameo appearance in, in this book. Uh, the book's a memoir, and it's called 1974. And most of it actually takes place in 1974. But there's a brief flat kind of flashback, or not so brief flashback, to the earlier 70s when I was living in um, Cambridge, Massachusetts, and uh, and having what I guess you could call a hard time to put it mildly. So, so I told Roger I would just read the two paragraphs in which he makes an appearance, and then I'm just going to read a little bit from the beginning of the book. So this is, uh, this is Roger's moment. Almost as soon as I got back to Cambridge, the phobias flared up again like a return of malarial fever. I've been able to cross the desert from Herat to Kandahar, the mountains from Kabul to Mazar-e-Sharif. But back in Cambridge, I couldn't manage to go to Julia Child's favorite supermarket. Because I'd done so badly during my first year in graduate school, Miss Classes failed to write a few papers, a kindly professor, Roger Rosenblatt, agreed to let me stay if I taught English C, beginning undergraduate creative writing, a course that no graduate students wanted to teach because it didn't interest them and couldn't advance their careers. So as I said, that's a little later. Thank you, Roger, for saving me back then. So this is how the book begins. Um, and as I said, 
1974. San Francisco, winter, 1974. There was less traffic then. At 10 on a weekday evening, Tony could take his 10-year-old putty-colored Buick up to 55 and slam bounce up and down the hills along Taylor Street. Maybe Tony thought somebody was following him. He certainly thought so later. Maybe he was right all along. He kept checking his rear view mirror. He'd make sharp U-turns and veer into alleys. He had every reason to suspect that he was under surveillance and he drove like someone trying to elude whoever was pursuing him. He said, we were right to be afraid. He said he was living proof of what could happen if he pissed off the wrong people, actually the right people, the government and the military, the criminals and the liars. He said they'd been working against us for years and that it would take courage and determination to defeat them. He said, if we told the truth, if we tried to talk about what happened, they called us paranoid. That was more or less what I thought too, and I liked hearing him say it. We were always looking for things we had in common, maybe because on the surface, we must have seemed so different. He was Southern, I'd grow up, grown up in New York. He was an aerospace engineer turned radical activist. I'd published a novel and was about to publish another. I was in my twenties, he was 10 years older. I had long dark hair. He was bald with a shoulder length fringe. We both cared about politics. We both liked stories. We both liked to laugh. We were both less easygoing than we tried to appear. We often talked about books. It turned out that Gravity's Rainbow was one of our favorite novels. It spoke to our belief that history and the forces that shaped it were in every way more sinister than the most evil scenarios we could imagine. In 1974, fans of Thomas Pynchon's dense, confusing 700-page conspiracy novel felt as if we'd found one another, recognized fellow, what? A group of people who distrusted groups. What did we take from the book? There's an order and a plan, but it's not the natural order and it's certainly not God's plan. It's more likely the wicked scheme of Nazi war criminals operating an armaments and pharmaceutical conglomerate manufacturing Zyklon B gas and the V2 rocket. That wasn't paranoia, that was just facing the facts. That was something we agreed on. It felt like a deep connection. Tony said we were right to worry. The impulse to destroy is as deep as the desire to create. When he was a kid in Virginia, they had a rogue history teacher who told them that the reason humans are the only species that kills its own kind was because of some evil Egyptian poison in the apple that Eve gave Adam. Word got out and the teacher was fired. Tony's science teacher told the kids that wasn't true. He wasn't going to touch Adam and Eve, but he said that many animals are as bad as worse when it comes to brutalizing their own kind. Lions, bears, primates, kangaroos, meerkats. I said, probably we're the only species that makes money from killing one another. Exactly, I said Tony, precisely, that's our meerkat nature. So it will happen again. Stronger countries invading weaker countries, larger countries swallowing, swallowing smaller ones, as long as there's profit to be made, and it pumps up some psycho dictator's ego. But we shouldn't be afraid because we're going to win. The war in Vietnam will end. Things are going to change. For the better, I said. For the better, said Tony. It was a chilly, rainy winter, maybe no colder or wetter than any San Francisco winter, but it seemed that way to me. I thought that California was warm year round. The weather felt like a personal insult. I'd moved out west wearing flip flops and I refused to admit my mistake and buy a pair of shoes. My feet were always freezing. The heater in Tony's car barely functioned and the dampness seeped up through a hole in the floor. We rode with the window shut. The car smelled like cigarette smoke, like the wet dog that neither of us had, like woolen coats in a grade school cloakroom. As we headed west through outer sunset and circled back along the avenues of outer Richmond, bright streaks of neon signage dripped down the windshield onto the glistening streets. I had no idea where we were going or where we would end up. I liked not knowing, not caring, not having to decide. I was 26. I liked feeling free, alive, on edge, even a little afraid. So what if my feet were cold? They wouldn't be cold forever. I wanted to feel like an outlaw. So did everyone I knew. Bonnie and Clyde were our Romeo and Juliet. 
I still have a photograph of the leaders of the Barrow Gang, the Depression era bank robber lovebird, lot, robber lovebirds, in heels and a long dress with a knitted top. Bonnie pokes a rifle and one finger into Clyde's chest, his immaculate white shirt. Slightly slumped, his hat pushed back, Clyde is looking at her half amused, half besotted. Played by Faye Dunaway and Warren Beatty in the 1967 film, the couple couldn't have been more beautiful or languidly stylish. They were our outlaw lover superstars, hotter than Seberg and Belmondo, that Clyde was apparently impotent made their love all the more tragic, chaste, and operatic. I can still see their mustard colored 1934 Ford sedan death car bucking and jumping as the hail of bullets pierced it or bounced off. I didn't want that, obviously, but I wanted the rush. I had just recovered from two bouts of what the early desert saints called the pain of the distance from God. Though I myself didn't believe in God, I understood what they meant. I was better now, or mostly, I wanted to stay that way. I wanted that freedom, the sense of not knowing or caring where I was going or what I was supposed to be doing. The dreamlike unreality of those high speed drives was nerve wracking, but weirdly relaxing. Nothing was expected of me. I didn't have to think, I hardly had to speak. All I had to do was listen. In the mid 1970s, I lived for months at a time in San Francisco. I'd stay through the fall and winter, then leave, then go back to New York, then return. I lived in the inner Sunset District, not far from Buena Vista Park, in a sunny apartment with two roommates, a couple I'll call Henry and June. There was no reason for me to be in California, except that I liked it there and because it was far from Cambridge, Massachusetts, where I'd left my husband and never wanted to return. California might have felt like a long vacation in limbo if I hadn't begun to think of myself as a writer. One perk of being a writer was that I could tell myself I was doing something even when I wasn't. I liked to think I was working on becoming a person on whom, as Henry James said, nothing was wasted. It sounded right, but I wondered about following James's advice because he and I always felt so differently about the people in his novels, his attractive grifters and wimpy, innocent marks. I like thinking that my new job description was to watch and try to understand who people were, what they'd been through, what they revealed or tried to hide, what they said versus what they meant, and how to find the right sentences, the right words, the right punctuation to get it down on the page. Meanwhile, I was at that stage when time and the body are singly, the unconscious. If you were going to make stupid mistakes, you should probably make them now. Everything seemed like a matter of life and death and inconsequential. Everything broken could still be fixed. The incomplete could be finished or anyway, so I hoped. I knew that my life and the world around me was changing, that something was ending and something else beginning, but I was too close to inside it all to have any idea what it was. Four years and two months after the last time I saw Tony, I had my first child, and from the moment my son was born, I was no longer the same person who thought it was interesting and fun to speed around San Francisco in the middle of the night with this chain, stranger chain smoking camels, alternating stretches of silence with long bouts of storytelling. Funny stories, not funny stories, frightening stories, stories that veered and rambled, stories that might have been only partly true, and then the silent tears. Sometimes when Tony cried, he shook his head as if he couldn't believe he was crying. I stared ahead at the windshield, partly to give him privacy, but mostly to set a good example of keeping your eyes on the road. Thank you. Really? Yep, coming. <laughs> <laughs> I'm here. Um, I just love that ending so of that sentence, so I was stunned. Uh, you can hear me now, right? Yes, I can, but I'm going to introduce you so that you can read. Oh, okay. So give me a second. Take Our next speaker time. is Billy Collins. Billy Collins is the author of 12 collections of poetry, including The Rain in Portugal, Aimless Love, Horoscopes for the Dead, Ballistics, The Trouble with Poetry, Nine Horses, Sailing Alone Around the Room, Questions About Angels, The Art of Drowning, and Picnic Lightning. He is also the editor of Poetry 180, A Turning Back in to Poetry, 180 More, Extraordinary Poems for Every Day, and Bright Wings, an illustrated anthology of poems about birds. A former distinguished 
professor at Lehman College of the University um, of New York. Collins served as Poet Laureate of the United States from 20, 2001 to 2003 and as New York State Poet from 2004 to 2006. In 2016, he was inducted into the American Academy of Arts and Letters. His latest book of poems is Musical Tables Poems, released in November. Please welcome to the screen, Billy Collins. Let me bring you in here. Well, it's great to be here. And I want to uh, begin by thanking uh, Roger um, for inviting me. Um, I don't have any poems with Roger in them, uh, as Francine included him, but uh, there's really uh, nobody in my poems except me. So um, Roger is really no exception. Um, <clears throat> so um, I'm gonna read a few poems and then looking forward to having a talk with Francine. The first poem is called The Trouble with Poetry. And I like to say that it's not that long because it's only one of the <clears throat> several troubles with poetry. The trouble with poetry. The trouble with poetry, I realized as I walked along a beach one night, cold Florida sand under my bare feet, a show of stars in the sky. The trouble with poetry is that it encourages the writing of more poetry, more guppies crowding the fish, fish tank, more baby rabbits hopping out of their mothers into the dewy grass. And how will it ever end unless the day finally arrives when we have compared everything in the world to everything else in the world, and then there is nothing left to do but quietly close our notebooks and sit with our hands folded on our desks. Poetry fills me with joy and I rise like a feather in the wind. Poetry fills me with sorrow and I sink like a chain flung from a bridge. But mostly poetry fills me with the urge to write poetry, to sit in the dark and wait for a little flame to appear at the tip of my pencil. And along with that, <clears throat> the longing to steal, to break into the poems of others with a flashlight and a ski mask. And what an unmerry band of thieves we are, cut purses, common shoplifters. I thought to myself as a cold wave swirled around my feet and the lighthouse moved its megaphone over the sea, which is an image I stole directly from Lawrence Ferlinghetti, to be perfectly honest for a moment, the bicycling poet of San Francisco who is little amusement park of a book I used to carry in a side pocket of my uniform up and down the treacherous halls of high school. And um, this is a poem, fishing it out here. This is a poem called Marijuana. Marijuana. When I was young and dreamy, I longed to be a poet, not one with his arms wrapped around the universe or on his knees before a goddess, not waving from Mount Parnassus or wearing a cape like Lord Byron, rather just reporting on a dog or an orange. But one soft night in California, I walked outside during a party lay down on the lawn beneath the lovely, lively sky. And after an interlude of nonstop gazing, I happened to swallow the moon. Yes, I opened my mouth in awe and swallowed the full moon whole. And the moon, and the moon dwelled within me as I returned to the lights of the party where I was welcomed back with understanding and hilarity and was recognized long into the night as the man who swallowed the moon, he who had walked out of a storybook and was dancing now with a girl in the kitchen. And this is a poem called uh, Genesis as in the Bible. 
Genesis. It was late, of course, just the two of us still at the table working on a second bottle of wine when you speculated that maybe Eve came first and Adam became, began as a rib that leaped out of her side one paradisal afternoon. Could be, I remember saying, because much was possible back then. And I mentioned the talking snake and the giraffes sticking their heads out of the ark, their noses up in the pouring Old Testament rain. I like a man with a flexible mind, you said then, lifting your candlelit glass to me. And I raised mine to you and began to wonder what life would be like as one of your ribs to be with you all the time, riding under your blouse and skin, caged under the soft weight of your breasts. Your favorite rib, I was assuming, if you ever bothered to stop and count them, which is just what I did later that night after you had fallen asleep and we were fitted tightly back to front, your long legs against the length of mine, my fingers doing the crazy numbering that comes of love. And um, I'm gonna move on to, uh, to this new book, uh, it's called Musical Tables. And uh, it's a rather, I mean, it's a totally unusual <laughs> book for me or anybody uh, because it's, uh, no one, uh, no poem is allowed in here over about five lines. I think one of them goes on to six lines, and but he's a bad boy. So they're at, I think the average is, is about 3.7 lines and there are 125 of these poems and um, and uh, maybe uh, Francine and I will talk about them a little bit as a, because I'm st I started to think of the small poem as a genre. And um, so I'm going to give you a sample of them. And um, so, I mean, there are so many, uh, so many uh, good poets uh, have, have experimented with the, uh, the, the short poem. And when I, when I get a book of poems by a new poet or just by a, po a book that's new, I have the, I have a habit of just kind of uh, flipping through the book um, and looking for looking for small poems. Um, so, some uh, really some good examples would be um, uh, A. R. Ad uh, um, Ammons has a poem called "Their Sex Life," which goes one failure on top of another. I found that one inspirational. So. Um, I'll read a few of them, and they'll just, if you don't like one, another one will be coming along. They're, they're as fast as buses. Um, 3 a.m. Only my hand is asleep, but it's a start. Breakfast. In the hotel restaurant, orange koi in a pond, I toss in some cornflakes. Carbon dating. He tried it once as a last resort, but most of the women were a million years old. Some of them are a little more serious. This is called divorce. No more heavy ball, just the sound of the dragged chain with every other step. Refrigerator light. The minute she slams the door, I stop thinking about her. Now this is called Bad Hotel. Bad Hotel. I told the woman from housekeeping who was eager to do my room to just come in and pretend I'm not here, which is exactly what I had been doing ever since I checked in. Now, believe it or not, the title of this poem 
is <clears throat> Henry Wadsworth Longfellow. Trouble was not his middle name. And uh, let's see. Disappointing freak show. A bearded man. A one-headed chicken. A sailor with a tattoo. And a three-legged piano. This is called Birthday Poem. Remember that birthday poem I wrote for you? It just stopped being about you. <laughs> it's kind of mean, isn't it? Um, child astronomy. After many hours of peering into a telescope, Goldilocks discovers a dipper that is just right. Uh, New York Directions. It's down in the village between bleak and bleakest. <clears throat> and I'll, uh, I'll finish with this one. Or this one will finish me. This one is called Children. There's a new movie out titled Children. I don't know what it's about but I like the voice on the radio when it says, children now playing everywhere. <clears throat> so that's me. Those are beautiful, Billy. Well, thank you. So I have a question about them. So do you, do you write them in your head? I mean, they're short enough to write in your head and keep in your head, or, or do you do them on the page the way you might? You might have longer. Well, more, more in my head because they actually uh, arrive, uh, not to make it too mystical, but um, they just, they occur. I mean, it could be uh, pr provoked by um, just uh, reading, um, you know, reading an image or something. Um, or I, I was, I thought the other day of uh, reading something that mentioned the stork as a bird that brings in the newborn in uh there uh, with a diaper ha hanging from their beak you know well that was enough to get me thinking i was thinking well if they if it if, you know if the, if storks carry the dead away if that's another job you'd need four stork storks you know uh, and then it was sort of well should we say by the hands and feet or by the wrists and ankles this is the kind of thinking we do but many of them just arrive and there's really um, no revision, maybe just tinkering with a, with one word or something. But um, it's interesting, excuse me, it's interesting what they, you know, what they don't have. They've, I mean, the, the, this poems this small have eliminated many things we uh, associate with poetry, like landscape. <laughs> There's really no play, place for that, no time for it. We've got to get on with things because the poem's going to end in two more lines. Um, or just development, like be there's no beginning, middle, and end. There's just a, I, I think of it, uh, the little poem, a small poem, as being a kind of pressure, like a torque, you know, um, a pressure with a twist to it, and a linguistic torque. And many of them are based on a kind of misunderstanding or in quite intentional. Uh, between what is figurative and what is literal. So if you say your hand is asleep, that's figurative. It's not really asleep. It's like <clears throat> putting your dog to sleep. He's not really asleep either. But if you mistake that uh, kind of stupidly or intentionally, perversely as being literal, then you can imagine your entire body being numb. Speak of your hand falling asleep. I, I wondered how many of these were insomnia poems. Oh, many of them, and many of them are hotel poems. Yeah, there, there, uh, there are a lot of uh, waiting. Uh, this one about waiting for the other pin to drop, which is taking you know, two, kind of mashing two cliches yeah, yeah, yeah. together. 
Yeah, you get it. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, was, I mean, I do a lot of writing in my head in the middle of the night. So, and you know, some of it I remember, some of it I don't, which is probably just, yeah. well, but, uh, but more and more lately. So. Well, I tell, you know, I've told my students, and I know we've both taught uh, writing and literature, um, uh, that if, uh, if you think of something in the middle of the night and, and you don't write it down, you're not going to be a poet. You have to get it. You yeah. have to get up and write it down. I mean, it could be, it could make no sense in the morning, could be, but it could be something that you would be incapable of writing if your consciousness got in the way or was in control. Yeah, unless you're still hanging on to that thread of hope that you're going to fall asleep, in which case it's a sort of a, <laughs> is this worth saving or is there a chance right. it might actually clock out here? Right. Well, Wilfred Sheed said, uh, uh, one ambient is worth a thousand sheep. <laughs> so, yeah. So, there's always that recourse. <laughs> Do you want to talk about, what would you like to talk about? I, I, I was so struck with, um, uh, I love that, Pat, the thing you read there, the new book. Um, so what if my feet were cold? They wouldn't be cold forever. That's such <laughs> well, you a know, kid. when you're in your 20s, whatever. That's such a kid's way of thinking. I'll just put up with this because you're so young, you're going to have such a long I know. life. I know. And also, I, I might be kept up tonight, and I'm, you're entirely to blame by thinking about human beings and their meerkat nature. <laughs> Yeah, well, there, I, I'm not, you know, I'm not exactly sure what meerkat are. I mean, do you happen to know what the difference between a meerkat and a fisher is? I'm just asking because they're the, the I know fishers have overrun our neighborhood lately. So, uh, so the chicken. Well, I don't, I'm not sure what. Right now. Are, is like a fisher running. like a neutrino? Is, is a fisher like a neutrino? Yeah, they're, but they're, but it's. Just to throw weird. in another weird animal. <laughs> well, I just like meerkat. Well, what yeah. are the ones that like, you know, sit up like this? Aren't those meerkats chipmunks? in a group and they're all looking around? Those aren't chipmunks? No, they're in. Well, they're very dogs. Those they're are very there. dogs. They may, you know, who knows? I'm not a zoologist. Some, well, animals. clearly somebody does. <laughs> but nobody in this room, this virtual room. Yeah, well, meerkat information, certainly <laughs> welcome. Somebody Google up meerkat and we'll find <laughs> out. Um. Well, I love that piece, and and is that that's a memoir, right? Yeah, although I, you know, there's something about the word memoir that's I find yeah. sort of embarrassing. You know what I mean? It's, it's yeah. sort of icky. It's kind and of nineteenth century something. Yeah, women also, in the nineteenth century did exactly, and you know, in between having the vapors and and uh, taking opium over the counter, but but. I don't, you know, it's a memory piece. I guess it's a memory, you know, I guess I yeah. can say that. And then of course, memory is so unreliable that, that I mean, there are long passages of dialogue in there that obviously could not have been remembered by me verbatim. Yeah. But then I'm thinking like, didn't bother Carl Ova Kanausgaard, why should I let it worry me? So. Well, even Keith Richards wrote a memoir, so. My life. You should be able to do it. <laughs> 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 I know. Yeah, I was in San Francisco in the like in the late sixties and early seventies, visiting, you know, back and forth. And uh yeah, the cold is it's extremely cold and damp. <laughs> so much yeah, it was pretty... <laughs> yeah. I, although I read somewhere that that because of global warming, they're saying that there's not gonna be fog in San Francisco. Oh, that's, that's terrible. terrible. Isn't that terrible? I know, among the among the uh, the downsides. Yeah, no, it was, I, uh, I love, I mean, I was a refugee from Cambridge, Massachusetts, and the, the, the distance difference between Cambridge and San Francisco, I mean, one of the things, there's a section in the book that the first night, you know, I'd been in Cambridge and it was just falling apart, and I got there and I was sort of cured the second I got there, so, so uh, I was introduced to the concept of the 24-hour grocery, which hadn't existed, as, and so that down the block from us, there was this grocery, and uh, my friend said, uh, why don't you just go get some avocados? Everybody was high, so we want guacamole. And I, I said, okay. And, you know, I've been extremely phobic and weird and, and I just went out. And in the grocery, the, uh, do you remember the cockettes when you lived out in, do you remember? Yes, the, uh, the radical, drag, radical group. You know, yeah. drag performers, incredibly vivid and alive and amazing. So I go to the grocery store to buy avocados and the cockettes are in the, 
grocery store and they're buying, like, they're buying these like family <laughs> size bags of you know, candy <laughs> corn and stuff like that. And I'm going like, oh my God, I'm not in Cambridge anymore. I felt like Darcy. I've been just whisked out of the black and oh, white wow. world into, and just set down <laughs> into, into full color. I remember being in Washington State and the, which isn't as quite as disorienting as San Francisco, but uh, I was going, I was at a writer's conference and I was going to the store there, you know, like a grocery store or a drugstore or something on a Saturday. And there was a clown outside, you know, in full regalia. And he was like bring, trying to bring people into the store. And so, okay, I, I go into the store and I get my stuff and I get online to check out. And I, and I look behind me and the, there's the clown. He's right there, you know, and he's got he's he's holding a Coca Cola, and uh, so I'm thinking I, I can't just ignore this, you know, and pretend everything's cool. And I I looked around. And I said just something really stupid, like uh, uh, I guess even clowns get uh, thirsty on a hot day like today. And he said he pulled himself up and he said, "Sir, I am not a clown. I am a performer." I said, "What?" Well, you look like a clown, man. So I got back to the, the dorms there and my friend Robin Hemley was there and I told him this story. And he said, uh, oh, you must have run into Touchy the Clown. <laughs> <laughs> Is it, isn't there a word? There's a word that means fear of clowns, right? I can't remember what, I mean, God knows what it is. Well, clowns are, they're, they are, there's that clown in the, um, in the in the Simpsons, Krusty is it Krusty the clown? Krusty the clown, yeah, yeah. he's quite frightening. He's, 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 Jew, he's a Jewish clown too. Yeah, and he's terrifying. His father's like, a rabbi. Yeah, it's weird. Well, should we? Uh, are we? <laughs> any other memories? <laughs> we, maybe people are expecting us to talk about writing, and we can. Oh, oh right, writing, writing, we can yeah. writing. Okay. Um, I looked into your uh, book today uh, on a uh, Kindle if the truth be known, and your book called uh, Reading Like a Writer. And uh, it's an intriguing title. And it was, I just like the way you uh, you go through every aspect of uh, of writing. Um, and I, I found that teaching, um, I don't know, teaching literature, and that's what I think you and I did more than creative writing, maybe, um, <clears throat> that I was teaching literature in the wrong, I mean, like you, I um, I was lucky, I lucked, totally lucked out with new criticism because that's, right. we just had explicacion de text and we just right. read really closely. And you do it, you'd, two hours in a seminar, you do it like do a Keats ode. And then, but you have, you escaped the French invasion, right? With uh, Der Derrida and the boys there. Yeah, and, no, I couldn't, I just couldn't. No. I mean, the, uh, the the theory heavy, but um, I I did I did teach. Um, I was thinking, uh, you know, I would teach very traditional way and say, you know, what is this? Uh, <clears throat> what does this tree represent, or something like that? And uh, and but the 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 questions I would ask in class and the way I would direct the conversation had I would had nothing to do with the way I wrote poems. I mean, I'd never think, uh, stop writing, I'd never think, well, wait a minute, what's the theme here? <laughs> you yeah. So so I tried at some point to, to get into my teaching of poetry what I really was thinking when I wrote poetry. And the main thing I was thinking is, how is this thing going to continue? How is it going to move forward? And finally, how in the world is it going to end? So I take a poem like Dover Beach and I'd, I'd show it, it as we look at it as a set of maneuvers, a set of uh, <clears throat> like uh, point by point navigation and, and how uh, an ending is achieved through all that. And that, that um, kind of stressing the hydraulics of the poem as a, as a living thing uh, really seemed to, I don't know what they thought of it, you never know, but it, it, it made it more realistic to me is more closer to the compositional process yeah no that's the only way i know how to teach that's the only way is just word by word line by line you know and i just warn them how insanely tedious it's <laughs> be sorry but that's but i you know i don't really know what a theme is although i've been trying to sort of group 
I mean, I teach one, I teach one class a year, one semester a year at Bard, and I, and I always try and pick a kind of common subject to group things that I want to read or I want to, and, and, and that's kind of interesting to me too, because, because it kind of makes me realize what I've been thinking about in a way that I wouldn't if I had, didn't have mm -hmm. to pick. So, so like <laughs> last fall, the year before, I taught this class called uh, Sympathy for the Devil. Oh yeah, it was called Sympathy for the Devil. And one of my students signed up, he thought it was going to be a course in Satanism. And I went, <laughs> no, it's a joke. You know, it's like yeah. a, it's a song. Kind of. So, so there are all these books and it was about how writers create sympathy for apparently unsympathetic characters. And then at the end of the semester, and this was like the first year back out of COVID. I mean, we were all still in masks and so forth. And we'd all been, I'd been teaching on Zoom, blah, blah. And, uh, and I looked at the list and I thought, I thought this reading, this course should have been called A Cry for Help. <laughs> Mine, that is, because yeah. all, it was, all it was so gloomy. Everything I was so dark and gloomy. So I went, okay, so, so next year, uh, I'm going to teach class on humor, which is what I did this year. And I thought that'll lighten it up. Well, first of all, it turned out that all the texts were darker and weirder than <laughs> the cry for help text. And, and then I realized about halfway through, first I thought I should have called the chorus things she thinks are funny, but we don't exactly. <laughs> that was my class. And, then, yeah. and that would have been fine. And then I realized that the class should have been called um, alienated women with weird senses of humor, because that was basically all we read or what we did. So, you know, Jane Bowles and Joy Williams and Deborah Eisenberg and so on. So I mean, just one more alienated and peculiar than the next. Yeah, the, someone said that the best courses are are, 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 are not the ones with the tricky titles. Uh, the best courses are like uh, English literature, uh, 18, 1830 to 1880. Um, but humor is impossible. I mean, I, I had to give a talk on humor once, and uh, it was like a keynote. And um, and I said, humor is like a bad dog. You call its name, and it runs away. No, it just goes in the other direction. And I, um, anecdotally, <laughs> I mean, we're just getting back to that, maybe. It was for safer ground. The, the late, great uh, Dan Meneker was a friend of mine, and we taught together at Southampton. Uh, uh, for a number of years, but one year we we taught. He was teaching a course on humor one year, and we taught in a building that uh, where the classrooms were just separated by one of those uh, you know uh, separators that you pull across there. So the rooms were quite porous in terms of what you could hear. And he was teaching humor, and um, apparently, like my class was laughing their heads off. <laughs> and so he admitted to me that. He was so he was so pissed off that he would stage laughter in his class. He'd go like a three, two, one, and they'd all they'd all <laughs> laugh. Yeah, well, that's why I thought it should be called things she thinks are funny and we don't, because I would be the, I I would be the only one laughing on many occasions. <laughs> yeah, that's the craziness that, that to which humor can drive you. No, it was real. It was quite. It was pretty difficult. I mean, they got it and they got what I was trying to do, and they were smart and wonderful. Blah blah. But um, I'm not going to do that again. Yeah. There's um, there's but you have taught writing, right? And some. Uh, I did. I did up until I don't know. Up until maybe. Well, I came. I I've never taught at Bard, so that was like 18 years. Yeah, ago. So right. I was not for almost 20 years. Did you? And like I said, I was bad at it. I mean, because I was like. I mean, the thing where the person whose work was being workshopped was not allowed to speak always just seems like, you know, the <laughs> self-education things of the Chinese cultural revolution, you know, like you had to up, tale, right? Like, you know, you're gagged. Right? Thank you. I feel like such a better comrade for having oh. had my tongue cut out, but such and such. <laughs> so, uh, so, and I felt like over-identified constantly with students whose stories were being talked about by relative strangers so i couldn't i just couldn't do it yeah well there are things i i think there are things that the, there did you find there are things that you can't well there are things that you can't teach and that that's maybe the the hidden the the elephant uh, in the room or the meerkat in the room um there there i mean um i mean one of them is is humor i don't think you, you can teach that and that sitting around a table and uh, verbal rhythm is another one 
that yeah. can't be taught i'm afraid um and you can you can say a line of uh poetry that just you know but um but um and it just you know nice ending or it just clumps along and um but the, a lot of people can't hear it it's like someone who's just tone deaf <clears throat> and yeah. uh yeah, one and class, I, just for that reason, I went around the room and I made everybody read the last paragraph of James Joyce's The Dead, just for the oh, rhythm. Man, just like yeah. I said, you know, and some of them were great and got it. And some of them were like, huh? Like, yeah. why did I think that was beautiful? The snow was general, yeah. Um, and it kept falling and falling and falling. Gently yeah, falling that's and one falling of the too, great right? paragraphs in English literature. Yeah. Uh, do you know that Joyce was... Uh, once approached by someone at a party, and uh, the guy said, uh, he's, he's just gushing about how Joyce was a genius. And, uh, and he said to Joyce, I, if, if you don't mind, sir, I would, if you would permit me, I would like to kiss the hand that wrote Ulysses. And Joyce said, well, I think that would be okay, but I, I have to tell you, it's done a lot of other things as well. As we all know, I mean, having read his letters, <laughs> we, we know a lot more about that than we might even want to know um where were we just a minute i don't know um yeah in another things, can't be, taught. things that can't be taught no you can't there can't, you can't although i you know from the years when i did teach writing i often enough had the experience of thinking well this person's never going to write anything great and then the person would write something great so yeah. it, it made me you know, doubly think maybe, A, maybe I shouldn't be doing this, right. and B, you can't tell. I mean, right. you, can't tell. you can't, you can't tell, you can't uh, teach being interesting. And I find that recently, um, I, and I mean, <laughs> in my age now, I, I find that the thing I really like about poems, that, that I like poems that are interesting. But I think what you can do in teaching writing is you can act as a matchmaker. You can ask someone in my, in a poetry class, have you read Kenneth Koch or do you know who that is? And uh, you should read him. I think he would help you along. I, so it's it's all based on influence, I think. And I think you you in your writing, you kind of agree with that. You're, you're never, I mean, writing is a very solo activity, but you're never alone because you have all these read, these uh, authors you've read and who are influencing your work. But um, maybe the guy says, well, yeah, I've read Kenneth Gogan. I don't like him. Okay, well, that's a bad match. Uh, <laughs> and how about, you know, somebody else? And and uh, I that's, that's the most I can do in a way. I, I think that's forgive the expression, the takeaway from a lot of workshops is hooking people up with the with uh, what you think might be a, a helpful influence. Because I know when I started, I didn't get a book published till, a poetry till I was over 40. And there were, there were many <laughs> reasons for that that we don't need to go into. But one of the reasons was I was just so intimidated by authors. I thought they were gods, you know, and and also, I was imitating the wrong people. You know, like in high school, I was I wanted to be like a junior uh, Lawrence Ferlinghetti, you know, and uh, and be or be like Jack Kerouac or something. And I, you know, I was learning something as I went along, but uh, I didn't figure out the right influences, or they didn't uh, occur to me until it was in my thirties, really. Yeah, I, I, I mean, I, I wanted to be Grace Paley for a while, and that wasn't going to work out. And then I want to be Garcia Marquez, and that sure wasn't going to work yeah, out. Yeah, that's but hard. Nonetheless, yeah, nice try. But but uh, but I learned. You you know, as you said, I learned from both of them. I mean, I learned. I learned. Yeah. There's something I learned from both of them. So you know, and there's some there's some pieces some pieces of fiction that are like made to be taught in literature classes. You know, and you I mean, like Dennis Johnson's stories from Jesus's Son. They're the perfect length. And also they really lend themselves to line by line readings and they, yeah. and they fit perfectly in like this two and a half hour class. So by the end, it's like da da. So, you know, they're sort of fail proof, really. I, yeah, I suspect that, uh, you know, Marvell wrote to his coy mistress because it was the perfect poem to teach in a 50 minute class. <laughs> he he yeah. knew that, you know, it was yeah. sort of anticipatory yeah. of him.
you know, I had the, the hardest during like the depths of COVID. I taught, you know, if there's a prison, what Bard has a, a prison teaching program. And um, I did it once in person, which was, it's pretty amazing. It was amazing. I taught great expectations in the prison and that was, uh, wow. And yeah, then, I, and then because of lockdown, they wouldn't let anyone go into the prison. So I taught on speakerphone to a class of students and uh, they could hear me, but I couldn't hear them unless they crossed the room and talked into the speaker. I mean, uh, it was the most yeah, insane. Yeah. It was yeah. the most insane teaching experience. And also because there was something about, um, they had been reading aloud a lot in classes, I could tell, and they were all very, very good readers. And they would start to read and it was so beautiful that I would start to cry. So I was on teaching and crying. <laughs> I was teaching and I was thinking like, thank God this is on speakerphone because I really try not to cry in classes. It's like not helpful. <laughs> yeah. Your students don't need it. But humor, I was just- Humor and crying, yeah. Crying, yeah. I, I was, um, I taught in a prison once and uh, it went it went pretty well. There was a very tall uh, prisoner who uh, was, uh, he looked uh, educated and uh, he was arranging the chairs and everything. And they had, they already had a poetry workshop there. Uh, later, the uh, the warden told me that he was in for a serial, he was a serial, he was a, a, uh, a doctor, a medical doctor and a serial killer at the same time but he seemed quite reformed but we were walking out of the prison you go through those double doors yeah, and yeah, yeah. all that and uh i said i i had to say it to the assistant warden or something i said i thought that that went pretty well and he said well nothing to take away from your your performance or whatever but if you had come in and done like shadow shadow puppets <laughs> they would have appreciated that too well yeah but, he said, yeah. because they're so forgotten, you know, you could come yeah. in and just do bang a pot or something or talk about, you know, what beads you're wearing. I don't know. They, 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 they feel forgotten. Yeah. Totally forgotten. Well, yeah. And it's not like they're going to miss class unless they've been confined to their cells. I mean, you know, college students, they get a sore throat and you don't see them now for three weeks. But Absent. Yeah. Do you, uh, do you, did you sense or do you sense a, a gulf, a widening gulf between you and your students just because you get older and where we get older and they don't? No, it's not so much that. I mean, because, you know, because I have kids and grandkids, so I'm like around yeah. younger people all the time. But but I think that I think that student age people now are are having a pretty rough, you know, like everybody else, are having a pretty rough time. Right. And um, and it became clear to me in, in all sorts of ways that, you know, the trauma, the various traumas we've all been through and and acknowledged and unacknowledged. And, and you know, and, and that this year, the students were the ones who were in lockdown during their senior year of high school or senior year uh, or freshman year of college. So, right. you know, there's yeah, wow. pain for it. So in that sense, yeah. I mean, because I'm so sane and they're crazy. Not exactly. I mean, we're both, we're, we were all pretty crazy. That's rough. You go through all the three years of being put down by seniors and then you can't be a senior. <laughs> yeah, and, and worse, you're stuck in, you're in mom and dad's basement still. I mean. And you can't pass on the mistreatment that you receive. No. Um, well, uh, I, I don't know if uh, anyone's learned, learned anything tonight. But. <laughs> Uh, that's what we, I've having, had fun. We're having, we're having fun. Yeah. Literature can be fun. Well, I just wanted to ask a question or two. Um, do either of you have anyone up and coming through your classes or people that you've met that you would want to share with us off the top of your head? Or I know this is rather sudden, but you may not. But you may, emerging writers that we want to that anyone of us would want to know about? Well, I don't, you know, I, I, emerging, I never know what emerging means. I mean, that is, you know, because nobody's heard of anybody unless you're Joyce Carol Oates, maybe. So everybody's emerging. <laughs> so um, I, you know, the one, the book I've been talking about are telling, well, there are two books I've been talking about, neither of them so emerging. I've been telling people to read. And one is, um, the James Hanahan novel, Didn't Nobody Give a Shit What Happened to Carlotta, which I just think is funny oh. and brilliant and amazing. 
and then certainly not emerging, but uh, but fun. And again, maybe I'm the only one that would think so. There's a book by Nick Hornby called uh, Dickens and Prince. And it's about Dickens and Prince and about what, I mean, apparently what, what do they have in common? They're both big passions of Nick Hornby, but also they were so prolific. I mean, apparently after Prince died, there's something like five to 8,000 of unreleased songs in a vault somewhere. And, you know, Dickens just wrote and wrote and wrote. And wrote. So, uh, and, and that the book's full of factoids about their lives, which I just kind of adored. And, and it's, and it put me on this, I've been listening to Prince on, on repeat since I read it. So I, I feel kind of grateful. That's cool. I mean, I heard about the book, but I'm glad you put it back on my radar because I hadn't really paid that much attention to it because my store's small. So I have to curate tightly. And once in a while, I'll hear something and wish I could pick it up, but I'll take a second look at it. Thank you. It's a very short, small book, Alice. So it will fit in your school, in your store real nice. Excellent. I think, of, I think of my mind as a very, very small bookstore. <laughs> I think you'll fit right in here. <laughs> with a large collect uh, postcard section. Oh, well, I would recommend a, a friend of mine is a terrific poet named George Green, and he has a, a book out called Byron's Foot. <clears throat> and that's kind of his signature poem, where he's a poem uh, that uh, hilariously uh, mocks uh, Byron for having a, <clears throat> a clumpy a club foot. And how in his portraits he's hiding it and he can't dance with uh, Lady Carolyn and <clears throat> because of that. But uh, uh, he's, I, I, I'd say he is uh, up and coming and emerging and deserves more attention. George Green. I wrote it down. Thank you. Uh, what are each of you reading right now? Or do you well, have anything specific? I know you just, just finished a semester, so. Well, the la well, I'll just say the last book I taught in the semester was um, My Life in the Bush of Ghosts by Amos Tutuola, which is one of my favorite books, which I don't, not that many people have read. And he was a, um, he was a, a Nigerian pipe fitter, basically. And he wrote two books, The Palm Wine Drinker and uh, My Life in the Bush of Ghosts. And they're both I didn't, you know, they're, I mean, life in the bush of ghosts, this kid runs into the bush of ghosts and he spends 20 years among the ghosts and then he gets out. That's the novel, but, but it's all the different kinds of ghosts, but it, but it combines uh, Yoruba folklore with, I don't know what, with something else. I mean, it has a very kind of self-taught feeling to it. And it's not exactly written in, I mean, it's not standard English, but it's not Patois either. It's just great. So I, I can't recommend it highly enough. Thanks. Billy, what are you reading these days? Well, I, I like novels where nothing much happens. Um, I'm, uh, I, 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 I've just read so many novels and seen so many movies that the, the gene or this mental synapse that cares about who's going to jump into bed with the other character and when it's just not there anymore. Um, so I, I like Jose Saramago a lot. Um, this book, Blindness and the Journey of an Elephant, is a wonderful book about a, taking an elephant as a gift across Europe. And uh, really, they nothing happens except they arrive, <laughs> finally. So right now I'm reading uh, Roberto Bellano's book, uh, The Savage Detective, Savage Detectives. And uh, <clears throat> not much, you know, not, not, it has a pretty low level of action and activity and expectation. Um, so so um, uh, I, I'm enjoying that quite a bit. I'm a very slow reader, so he's been uh, novel of that size uh, spends a lot of time on my on my nightstand. Have you read two six six six, Billy? His, mm. I mean, so much happens in that book you can hardly bear it. It's just like nonstop, and it's I don't know, it's eight hundred pages. It's one of my favorite novels. It's really crazy and great but it's, and, eight, it's 800 pages long so which which writer wrote it Bologna Bologna okay uh well that's next I, this is my first Bologna so there's some very very short ones too by night uh -huh. yeah well, well I like folks, the kind of flat lining feeling there where things like in blindness where nothing happens except things get worse right yeah. <laughs> that's the arc that's the, that's, that's the arc it's not quite an arc it's more of an <laughs> angle down yeah. 
Well, folks, we've come to the end of our hour, as much as I hate to say that. I mean, it's been a just, it's been a great ride. Thanks so much. It's been a wonderful discussion and I loved hearing your work. So thank you again. I'm going to sign off and say good night to people. You're welcome. Thank you for very much. Me. Remove. I'm going to remove your spotlight, Francine. I muted you too early. I'm sorry. Unmute and say what you want. I'm sorry. I was just going to say thank you, Alice. Thank you, Billy. Oh, uh, you're so thoughtful. Thank you. But I'd like to thank Francine and Billy for participating in Write America this evening and for everyone who tuned in tonight. And thank you to Roger Rosenblatt for creating this original and important series to look forward to each week. Tonight's episode is the perfect example of the purpose and mission of Write America. We're going to take a break for the holidays, but we hope to see you when we rejoin in the new year, Monday, January 9th, as we welcome Paisley, Rectal, and Carlos Fonseca. Please note, that after January 9th, the rest of the episodes for the month of January are going to be on Tuesday nights. And then we will end the series at the very end of the month on the 31st. So do check out Bird's Books Write America page where you can find out information about our upcoming episodes and maybe purchase a book or two. Thank you all for joining us this evening and happy holidays to all. <laughs>